Um, again, welcome. This is the website of the uh, Institute of Network Cultures. We uh, uh, started off in uh, 2004, so we're 14 years old. That's, that's quite a long uh, time for uh, an internet uh, initiative, an environment in which uh, things uh, you know, so rapidly uh, change. Uh, it's probably we're very uh, successful because we are very small. And so we are only basically two or three people. It's one room, so it's it's really tiny. Uh, but um, of course, the strength is not in the in the, in the amount of staff, but uh, in the in the approach that we um, set up networks, bring people together, and uh, you know, in an activist way, uh, try to ach achieve. Uh, a lot. So in that sense, we are maybe not a, a traditional research institute. Uh, we are uh, very much focused on getting things done and um, uh, yeah, doing doing stuff. This is maybe a bit yeah on the Dutch pragmatist side, but it's also on the let's say 1980s activist side because that's uh, that's where I come from. I come from the squatter movement and the autonomous movement. Uh, of the 80s and uh, 90s, so uh, for me the, the the change from the from the social movement to uh, the internet uh, uh, politics is a, is a very natural development, and I go back uh, between uh, between the two uh, all the time. Okay, uh, one of the first networks that we started is. Uh, this one it's called Video Vortex. It's the oldest one. Started in 2006, focusing on the politics and aesthetics of online video, YouTube. Uh, it's a very simple uh, question that we ask. You know, what is the difference between online video and uh, the language of film and television? So, what is the difference between the film, uh, in the language of cinema, think of montage and so on and so on, all those principles, and uh, the, the online uh, environment? And what, what does it mean, where, what Lev Manovich says in his famous book, uh, The Language of New Media, uh, that we deal here with database cinema? What does it mean when we look at Netflix and YouTube, uh, when we watch a database? Uh, what is database watching today? Hmm? Uh, and uh, yeah, what is the role of the, of the user uh, in that? Think of the whole, uh, you know, importance of the comment space, of, uh, but also the whole recommendation economy, of course. There's so many elements uh, that we, uh, you know, do not really uh, understand uh, very, very well. In part because, uh, you know, it's secret, it's co corporate secret, uh, and so a lot of it uh, is, of course, hidden. So this is the most uh, maybe successful network, still going. Uh, almost every every year we have a <coughs> gathering. Uh, this was the last one in India. Yeah, this network is more or less uh, uh, independent. In principle, it can also exist uh, without us. A smaller one that we uh, ourselves that we love, but that is extremely unpopular, especially amongst funders and um, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, that is this uh, one called Society of the Query, which deals with uh, search engine and search. Now, search is really something uh, that has become almost subliminal today. Everybody is searching, but we don't even uh, notice that we're searching, right? And this also uh, tells us something about the importance of it, but also why it is so unimportant and perceived as something that almost no longer exists. Right? It is no coincidence that today, uh, over the last weeks, uh, we're talking about uh, Cambridge Analytica and the Facebook drama. Where is Google? Right? Google is already moving uh, into uh, the invisible realm of the infrastructure. And the prime example of that, of course, uh, is the politics uh, of uh, the algorithms they are utilizing, the, their um, uh, the ways to earn money, right? So for us, Society of the Query is uh, is a really, uh, I know it, 
potentially, of course, very boring topic, right? I mean, what is more boring than databases and, uh, and search engines, right? But it's extremely uh, important if you understand the, the, the way the internet came into existence and is still used uh, today. Uh, don't forget uh, that this one, uh, YouTube, is the second biggest search engine. YouTube uh, is in essence a search engine uh, and very much, uh, of course, owned by the same company. Uh, so, uh, so the logic of search is very uh, uh, fundamental. And of course we can say that, uh, the, let's say, the social media logic of Facebook and all the rest with likes and recommendations, etc. is a serious attempt to undermine uh, the logic of, of search, right? So these are really two competing models, if you, paradigms, if you like. This week we got a call from somebody from the, from the geek world who said, yeah, maybe there is money again for, uh, to do a society of the query. So, you know, uh, suddenly we were all excited again. So, who knows? Uh, maybe uh, so, uh, we can all, uh, announce uh, this. Because, you know, there's tons happening. There's so many artists working on this topic. A lot of uh, interesting, groundbreaking, alternative research happening in the field of, of search, right? Uh, we hear a lot about, uh, you know, are there alternatives for uh, Facebook? Well, and the de depressing answer is, of course, no. Uh, but in the space of search, you know, there's really something happening. Look at uh, the success of DuckDuckGo, and this is really an inspiring example uh, of uh, people who came together said we need to do it in a different way with fundamentally different premises, not steal the data of the users and so on and so on. So DuckDuckGo is really, okay, it's in the realm of search, it's not in the realm of social media, that is true, uh, but definitely uh, it is an alternative and we don't hear uh, much about it. Okay, this is an older project, uh, uh, quite short-lived, we worked on it for a couple of years uh, and we were very sad that we, we couldn't uh, uh, continue it. It's kind of the, the critique of Wikipedia, um, uh, together with a, a group, uh, quite a big group uh, in, uh, in India, in Bangalore. We worked on the, let's say, also the post-colonial point of view, uh, so the, to look at it. Wikipedia and the way the code is structured, the way the knowledge production is structured as a product, uh, let's say, of the Western male geek, right? And the, 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 the post-colonial critique of the Western male geek uh, is something that, you know, yeah, is uh, or has yet to happen, right? We are uh, not, uh, not there yet, but we know that this is a very uh, interesting uh, field. So this is uh, so they in uh, in Bangalore continued uh, to uh, work on this, especially in the in the national branch uh, of Wikipedia. We think that we don't hear enough about the politics of uh, Wikipedia. Right? This is a topic that was big, uh, let's say six seven years ago. Uh, since then, uh, Wikipedia has absolutely stagnated. It's not doing well. Uh, of course, it's begging for money the whole time, etc. But um, you know, the, the participation of ordinary uh, internet users is going down dramatically. And it, although the traffic of uh, Wikipedia is going up, of course, it grows further because also remember they are very much supported by uh, Google, who uh, you know uh, often uh, points to uh, Wikipedia. Uh, nonetheless, the internal participation uh, and so the internal contribution and the diversification of the entries is absolutely stagnating and this should be uh, a real concern for us. It is the biggest non-profit uh, uh, project on the internet as we speak and has been for the last 15 years is going to disappear, right? So this is, uh, this is really something uh, that uh, requires our attention, we think. In 2011, uh, during the Arab Spring, uh, the movement of the squares, uh, and then uh, Occupy, we started to uh, focus on uh, the critique of social media, 
and um, uh, the combination, uh, in fact, of the critique of Facebook uh, with the quest uh, for alternative social media. During uh, the, this year uh, of global protests, uh, a lot of uh, alternative uh, social media uh, emerged. Think of Loria in Spain, but also Diaspora and uh, a number of others, right? Uh, so we are now almost seven years later, and unfortunately, I have to say, uh, you know, we haven't made much progress. Uh, and, and this is uh, also a big concern, right? Although internet traffic and the amount of use is still growing, uh, the, the attention for the alternatives are uh, not growing, in fact they're kind of fading away or at best uh, they are uh, stable. Um, yeah, in 15 we organized the big fa Facebook farewell party in the Dutch uh, National uh, Theater. Um, yeah, that, that for, you know, almost every year there is a major Facebook uh, scandal. Of course now there is a very big one. Uh, with uh, Cambridge Analytica, but it's by no means the first one. I don't know if you have somewhere read the chronology uh, of the Facebook privacy scandals, right? Uh, it goes back to the very beginning. Uh, so in 2015, uh, this is also what we uh, did. Of course, uh, in over the last couple of weeks, uh, we have seen, uh, especially uh, through the the Twitter hashtag uh, delete Facebook uh, arise uh, in uh, discussions and in people uh, who are leaving Facebook. We will uh, not know, uh, you know the extent of how many people, uh, globally speaking, uh, have already left Facebook. Uh, probably uh, in a little while uh, we will know this uh, through uh, advertisement uh, revenues and indirectly uh, uh, and retrospectively we can find out, but directly, of course, Facebook will never uh, give us any reliable data uh, about that. Uh, having said that, um, by and large, the amount of people who left Facebook over the last weeks is uh, yeah, not really substantial, but then it, this is the really first big waves. There have been other waves, uh, but nothing uh, like what we've seen uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, last night uh, we had uh, a meeting uh, uh, in Amsterdam of the Facebook Liberation Army. Uh, we were there with about 25 people and it was a good uh, serious discussion, you know, where the, the alternatives are. And I was, I was impressed about, um, yeah, the, the slow but significant progress uh, we've uh, we've made uh, when you when you look at it and everybody tells you know I'm using this I'm using uh, this other platform I'm using uh, what, whatever uh, Signal or uh, yeah there's there's of course a whole lot of uh, uh, alternatives out there not precisely social media in the narrow sense of uh, full-fledged uh, Facebook alternatives but nonetheless uh, there is something happening and in particular I want uh, to point here at, uh, at Activity Hub. Uh, uh, Activity Hub is, uh, is the place, uh, it's, it's not really a network, but it's a protocol. And this is really uh, something that has grown over the past uh, years. And uh, the most uh, well known right now is the one uh, below uh, on the list. It's called Mastodon. The, the principle and the, the idea here is that this is a federation of decentralized servers, right? And a lot of people complain, ah, oh, the internet has become so centralized, and uh, the infrastructure is centralized, uh, it's all uh, about uh, a handful of uh, data centers around the world that communicate with each other. Uh, well, uh, this is, uh, this is the, the real, uh, let's say, radical, full-fledged, uh, uh, free software uh, alternative and uh, it is good uh, if you are interested uh, to have a look uh, at, uh, at this and maybe open you know a local pod as it is called uh, probably there are already Ljubljana pods so there is one uh, so there is already a, a, a node 
let's say, uh, an active uh, uh, node here in uh, Ljubljana. The uh, events uh, within this framework of uh, state machines uh, is uh, that we uh, are giving uh, to the crypto design challenge. Maybe that's a very Dutch idea uh, that you can solve the world problems through design. I know that's. Uh, <laughs> Please don't take it too seriously, but uh, anyway, this, this is where we come from, this is our culture. So, uh, if there is a problem in the Netherlands, uh, we call it the designers uh, to solve them. And uh, so, uh, that is also the case with uh, privacy and maybe even with uh, the social media. We strongly believe that if you build uh, a good and accessible uh, uh, interface, uh, you know, uh, larger groups of people uh, will uh, ultimately uh, get involved and uh, will uh, understand uh, if something is, uh, you know, easy to use, uh, uh, yeah, there are just less obstacles uh, to get involved. Uh, so our agenda uh, in this whole realm is to emphasize uh, the, the user interface experience, and, and to reflect uh, on that uh, as well. Another element, I would say, that always comes back in our work uh, in Amsterdam uh, is the emphasis on the working conditions uh, in, the, in what is now called the creative industries or uh, you know, what, what used to be called uh, the new media sector or uh, uh, arts and culture. And there are, of course, different uh, uh, names for, for this, uh, uh, let's say, cultural creative uh, activity. For some people it's called uh, you know, the startup uh, sector. The, the name for it is my creativity, uh, and it's a critique of the creative industries uh, policies, that, which uh, you know, were introduced in the Netherlands, uh, especially after uh, the 2008 financial uh, crash and uh, the uh, the rise of the austerity measures, in which the cultural sector in the Netherlands shrunk by half, right? In 11 and 12, uh, really overnight, the whole, uh, you know, uh, cultural sector uh, was uh, reduced by 50%. So this was uh, a really a, a big uh, shock. Uh, and uh, instead, what we got was the neoliberal message like, okay, you are an artist, so you, you are uh, an entrepreneur. Everybody uh, here in this hall is an entrepreneur. Not, a, not even if you don't know it, you still are an entrepreneur, even if you don't like it, uh, uh, you are, right? So this, this is kind of uh, the, uh, the, the ideology that uh, is now dominant in the, in the Netherlands, probably here as well. Uh, on, our, on our blog, if you go to networkcultures.org, uh, you find uh, one, uh, one specific blog which is uh, uh, written by uh, an Italian designer who works with us, based in Rotterdam, uh, and his name is uh, Silvio Lorusso, and uh, the name of the blog is Precarious Entrepreneur, let's say. Uh, that the, the precarious class and the entrepreneurial class in this construct are kind of moved uh, into, uh, into one. Another uh, activity uh, that we have recently started, because yeah, we have less and less money and uh, we cannot start um, uh, new initiatives, and this is really uh, frustrating for us, but this is certainly one, a new one, which we uh, launched last year. Um, which is looking really at the new uh, politics of the online self. Uh, the work that uh, Patricia de Vries uh, presented here about uh, anonymity and mask design is part uh, of, of that. This uh, event in Rome uh, was uh, focused on, let's say, a critical theory of the selfie. And so we really love the, the selfie and it is very, very important to uh, you know, not uh, look down on it, or, uh, but to politicize uh, that field and to theorize it. This is uh, important for us. Throughout the years, we have put out a lot of publications, and this one uh, here uh, is one of them. Uh, it's kind of uh, now our specialization. 
So after 14 years, uh, after yeah, a number of years, I have to say, we just found out that, you know, in fact, we are running a publishing house. Just to, but we di didn't call it like that. And uh, uh, so it's a digital publishing house. Uh, in part, it's, of course, related to the rise also of, of digital publishing. Think of uh, reading on your smartphone with the EPUB. Uh, or uh, think uh, of uh, reading on the iPad and uh, the tablet. Uh, um, so, so that, uh, and now we got uh, twice, we got a, a, a real research grant, uh, applied research grant of, of the Netherlands to do that. And the, the, the second one, in fact, starts uh, in June. So we're quite uh, excited about that. And so this is in, in, in publishing, if you want to publish uh, something with us, you know, please contact us. We're very open uh, for that. This is our uh, specialization. We also help you with English uh, copy editing, maybe translation, stuff like that. If you have a, uh, also, if you if you still study and you have for like a master thesis, we also are interested in in that to work with you. Uh, we have an, uh, a special series for for students and, and for young researchers uh, called the INC Long Forms. Uh, you know, we are uh, inviting all of you, uh, you know, to, uh, to join and, and send us uh, uh, proposals. Uh, one specific uh, uh, form uh, of that uh, that we have now started to specialize on is this uh, kind of the, the publishing crisis uh, in the circles of uh, art uh, critics. Uh, art critics are, uh, especially uh, if you look at it uh, European-wide, uh, uh, they're becoming less and less, there's less and less money for it, less and less space in radio and television, uh, there's less and less uh, uh, dedicated magazines. Uh. First, this was a, a Dutch-Flemish network, so in the years before, uh, we worked uh, on this with, uh, with our comrades in uh, Antwerp and Brussels, uh, primarily, Gent other places and since half a year we turned that into a, a, a real uh, European network so uh, the art of criticism is, uh, is now if, so if you are interested or if you know art critics who uh, want to uh, join this and who are also interested in experimenting with new forms of digital publishing uh, think about training for art critics think about politicizing the field demanding more money, space, access, uh, but also do, you know, technical training in terms of podcasting, blogging, you name it. There's, of course, a, a wide uh, variety of new uh, technical skills that art critics should know these days, right? Uh, uh, but which is, of course, not taught at universities or uh, you know, no way. Uh, so the, 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 the training of art critics is still very traditional and so is their focus. But the reality uh, in the world out there is a very different one. So that's the aim of this uh, network. And now we turn to uh, tonight's uh, topic, which is uh, the Money Lab uh, Network which we started in, uh, in 2013 and the first event opened by Saskia Sassen uh, was in, uh, in 2014. Uh, now remember, uh, after the uh, global financial crisis 2008, a half a year later, uh, the Bitcoin uh, white paper was um, uh, published, uh, so in early 2009, uh, and then it, of course it became uh, also on our radar uh, in uh, late 2010, uh, when uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks uh, started to call for uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, uh, donations, because they were cut off uh, from the Master and Visa uh, credit card uh, system. Maybe you uh, remember uh, that uh, specific episode. So, uh, so that's one of the beginnings. Uh, and uh, yeah, I got involved in around uh, in 2011, uh, um, visiting the first uh, Bitcoin uh, events, uh, and then uh, yeah, soon uh, soon after 
uh, we started to build this uh, Money Lab agenda. And you can see here uh, the agenda that we try to focus on is pretty broad. What we don't want to do is only focus on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies because there are, first of all, there are an enormous amount of uh, events already happening uh, in there. And in our view, the critique of the cryptocurrencies should be put in a larger uh, framework. We cannot only focus on Bitcoin in, in the narrow sense, even though you know, that's very necessary. Uh, uh, it is very good to, uh, that to see it in a, in a broader framework. So our frame, framework that we chose is to say what are the alternative uh, revenue models on the internet for artists. This was our question. Or to put it even more broadly, how are artists in the 21st century going to make a living? Uh, if you take into account uh, that, for instance, when it uh, depends on Google and Facebook, uh, they will always have to give away their content for free. So, you know, uh, so if it depends on uh, Silicon Valley, artists will always have to, uh, you know, work during the day and then in the night they can make something nice and then they can uh, share it and, and give it away for free, right? This is, this is their idea, uh, but because content is for free. Uh, this has been the uh, internet ideology now for decades. Uh, and uh, the idea of Money Lab is really to uh, accelerate uh, the, the crisis of the economy of the free and say, no, we don't want to do that anymore. We want to redistribute the wealth on the internet. We need to discuss how the money that is flowing there, which is an awful lot of money, huh? how it comes to the content providers, right? And one part of the Facebook critique is, of course, uh, related uh, to that. Why should all that money uh, go uh, to this uh, one company through uh, advertisement? Okay, so, okay, here you can see there's a lot of uh, different stuff. Uh, one of the first things we started uh, was uh, yeah, a crowdfunding resource, but we also looked at uh, for instance, M-Pesa in Kenya and Eastern Africa. Uh, there's a lot of uh, local currencies happening. And <coughs> in all that, uh, like with all our projects that we do at INC, we focus on artists' involvement. So uh, what are the artists uh, doing in this field? Can we invite them? Can we help them? Can we initiate new uh, art uh, projects? Uh, we had three events uh, in Amsterdam just to uh, get it going. In uh, 15, you can see uh, artistic uh, in interventions in finance, and this is number three. You know, you can also see uh, there's a slight evolution uh, of uh, uh, the, uh, the topics. And if you look at workshop one, for instance, that this is something that we are ultimately interested in. Uh, so, to, let's say, to bring together the experiments that we do in digital publishing together with the revenue models. So that, our, uh, so that writers uh, will get money from their writing. Now, I know that sounds almost utopian, uh, but uh, this is ultimately uh, where uh, we should go. If you write an interesting essay, uh, uh, there should be ways, uh, you know, that the people who read it uh, can make direct peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments to you. Uh, in, the, in the current network architecture, this is completely uh, impossible and uh, in our view should, uh, should change and we should um, initiate experiments uh, with that. How we, can, uh, how, how we can get there. We emphasize that uh, time and again. The cryptocurrency way is not the only way. Right? Uh, so we should um, not back on one uh, course. Okay, here you can see the uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, the question uh, that uh, that we uh, ask. Uh, so we ask, uh, we try to do, let's say, very traditional uh, ideology criticism, uh, if you like. Uh, so what are the the underlying premises of um, uh, of this new digital money. 
But we understand that we do that uh, because uh, we believe that uh, there is a crisis also, uh, let's say, in the, in the elites. Uh, for instance, in the elites here in, in Slovenia, and you have basically given away all your sovereignty uh, to Frankfurt, right? There is no national bank anymore uh, in Slovenia uh, to speak of, and the same in the Netherlands. Uh, this, uh, these, uh, these, are, these institutions are a farce. Uh, they, they, have, they don't have uh, anything uh, to say anymore, right? So, so we have already given away this national let's say, sovereignty uh, over our, our national uh, currency. But on top of that, uh, there are now uh, new forms of digital uh, currency uh, happening at the same time. Uh, these uh, these uh, two things, for instance, they are absolutely uh, they're related. And the fact that money is now digital uh, this um, creates a lot of new uh, uh, possibilities that did not exist in the past. Uh, even 20, 30, 40 years ago, it would be inconceivable to say, okay, we'll just start our own uh, currency. Yeah, that's a nice art project, but, uh, you know. But these days it's really possible. And also ask the question of, you know, what is the value of our uh, prototypes? If we build a pilot or something like that, if we do an art project in this field, uh, where it is not innocent uh, because we are absolutely uh, contributing to the wider discussion uh, about this topic. We are. Uh, we, uh, you can say, okay, but we are very marginal, who cares about us? No, that's not true. Because uh, uh, also the, the, the experiments that happen uh, on different uh, levels, let's say, uh, initiated by venture capital in the entrepreneurial realm, coming out of business schools, uh, happening inside uh, a computer science department. They are also, you know, they're all conceptual artworks, at least up to now, right? Uh, nothing really scales at the moment, uh, as of yet. Uh, so e even the Bitcoin realm is, is relatively uh, small. It looks all very, very interesting, uh, those uh, market uh, capitalizations of 100, uh, what is it, 150 billion uh, uh, US, something like that. But uh, in fact, um, uh, all of that is just paperware. And so uh, it, 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 it can uh, disappear overnight. And so uh, in, that, in the same way, you can also look at uh, the um, uh, projects that we uh, present here. Okay, one of the first um, uh, uh, real uh, research that we did, we built a, a toolkit for crowdfunding research. And I'm not really sure if a, uh, a lot of crowdfunding research happens here, but for sure there is crowdfunding, there's a platform, I suppose, or more. How many platforms are there here, crowdfunding? One. One? Okay. Yeah, well, uh, but you know, who is doing the research into that platform? Uh, is that independent or is that done? Huh? by the people themselves, how does it really uh, work. And this knowledge needs to, needs to spread, especially amongst artists and activists. Often they depend on, uh, if you want to you know, make a film, do a, a theater production, um, finance an artwork, or uh, some uh, activist work, uh, very often uh, starts with a, a crowdfunding uh, campaign. So, uh, so to spread the knowledge what works and doesn't work uh, is absolutely uh, essential. The same can be said, uh, you know, in Africa. Here we have a, a lady I visited in uh, uh, Kampala, in uh, Uganda. Uh, is the question of, uh, let's say, more peer-to-peer -peer networks of digital money. So because this system in Africa is, is quite simple and it works with uh, SMS, it works also on uh, you know, the, the ordinary uh, old school uh, Nokia phones. Uh, so in that, in that sense, uh, this, um, this technology to transfer money from one phone to another uh, was able to, uh, to spread very fast and is still uh, dominant and now uh, slowly moving uh, also in Africa uh, to the realm uh, of, the, of the smartphone. Uh, one of the persons who has you know, really uh, written a lot about it and has been active uh, really as an activist and journalist is Brad Scott, originally from South Africa, based uh, out of London. Uh, this is his, uh, his book, 
uh, on, uh, uh, on the topic. And this is really an, an, an early work, but he's, for, for us, he's still the number one uh, uh, you know, person, really. If you want to read inspiring work, really good, uh, very polemical uh, essays uh, that uh, discuss uh, uh, the current affairs uh, in this field, uh, please, uh, you know, visit his uh, website or uh, his Twitter feed, whatever, whatever you want to follow. He is, uh, we also promote his work on the Money Lab uh, 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 website and list. And, uh, uh, also, he is in the first reader and in the second reader, and I think he has so far spoken on, uh, on all uh, Money Lab uh, events. So, for us, uh, he is a very uh, important uh, player. Uh, he used to work uh, in the, the city of London, so he, he was really uh, an undercover activist working uh, in the big, big banks to get um, an understanding how the industry works before uh, he left and then started to do uh, his activist uh, and his uh, journalistic work. Uh, another uh, one who is uh, also uh, in, an important uh, person is the uh, uh, Italian artist Paolo Sirio. I think he's based in uh, New York these days. Uh, here you see uh, his, uh, one of his many uh, kind of letterbox firms. Uh, he went uh, often to the, the Cayman, Cayman Islands. Uh, so he, he kind of uh, tries to understand how uh, the money flows. Uh, work, for instance, in the case of uh, Google, uh, uh, setting up uh, all sorts of uh, firms, uh, money that flows uh, through the Netherlands, and so on, and so on, right? So, uh, so this is that kind of uh, investigative work, uh, and that we then, uh, uh, of course, seen on a much larger scale uh, uh, in uh, with the Panama Papers, and then also recently. Uh, the Paradise Paper. So these these are this is kind of a uh, there is a lot of artists involved, especially also on, in the field of info visualization of these money flows, illicit money flows. Uh, so that is uh, another uh, side of uh, uh, of the work, just to understand global finance, uh, because this is for for so many of us uh, such a impenetrable uh, terrain. Uh, one of the books uh, that I kind of like, there's not very many uh, in this field, but this one, Nathaniel Popper, if you look for a book, you know, on, uh, on the early days of uh, Bitcoin, it tells the first five years uh, of the scene. Uh, it also tells about all the, the forks and the, the enormous uh, controversies internally in between, you know, between the different factions uh, of um, of Bitcoin, it tells a bit about the prehistory going back to the to the 90s. Um, so yeah, this is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, I can recommend. I write about it every now and then. And if you, if you uh, look into my books, uh, especially the last one, Social Media Abyss, I have three chapters uh, in there, in which I try to you know catch up, summarize. Uh, what is going on uh, in this field. Uh, one of the texts uh, that uh, I wrote, which is also in the, in the second Money Lab reader, is this one. Uh, I wrote together uh, with Edouard Dion and uh, Patrice uh, Riemens. And uh, here we, we just try to uh, have a polemic with uh, the Bitcoin believers, who are very often right-wing, uh, uh, you know, libertarians uh, who strongly believe in, uh, in uh, uh, the religion of uh, Ayn Rand and things like that. Um, Hayek, you name it, right? This is all kind of common sense. Uh, so the Bitcoin cryptocurrency field uh, is really dominant, dominated by extremely right-wing uh, uh, market uh, ideology. And uh, yeah, sometimes we say, yeah, but maybe maybe there is some kind of left-wing, autonomous, uh, uh, anarcho uh, undercurrent. Well, maybe that's true. There is there is some of that. Uh, uh, but it, I have to say, especially lately in the last one or two years, the balance really goes 
uh, really to uh, the right wing. And David Colombia is, is someone who has uh, written also a book to critique the right wing, uh, you know, underpinnings of the cryptocurrencies. So uh, there is some work uh, done in that field. Uh, in this text, um, yeah, we we kind of go through uh, uh, a few myths. Uh, I will read uh, uh, some of them here. Uh, well, the first myth is of course that. Bit Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer system, right? Well, that's absolutely nonsense because uh, it's a highly concentrated uh, uh, environment in which uh, anywhere between 50 and 60 percent is in the hands uh, of uh, of a few Chinese miners, right? So the so the Chinese uh, uh, yeah have organized uh, the production, uh, the mining of these uh, coins very early on. Uh, so, um, so to say that uh, you know this is a decentralized system uh, is, uh, in, in fact, uh, just pure nonsense. Uh, there's there's a very few uh, big players, and this is of course something that we see uh, happening in, uh, uh, in in the internet uh, overall. Right? And Bitcoin is uh, not an, uh, an exception here. Um, yeah, another um, myth, for instance, is that uh, Bitcoin does away with intermediates and fees. Well, that obviously uh, also not uh, not the case. And the miners uh, are the new uh, intermediates, and, and the miners are in a way uh, the new banks. Uh, uh, now, this is not you, you're not supposed to say that uh, because uh, this is uh, this goes counter to uh, the religion. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, it is important uh, to take a, a, a erratic uh, 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 point of uh, view uh, in this matter and, and really talk about what is actually going on. And the fees, for instance, now with a very high uh, Bitcoin price, the fees are high because they are based on percentage, right? So uh, you pay a percentage uh, uh, if you buy. Uh, Bitcoin, and so at the moment uh, uh, the the fees, uh, the miners, uh, they uh, and others, they uh, earn a fortune uh, just because uh, of the high price of the Bitcoin, and it was uh, so absurdly high uh, in late seventeen. I remember uh, Bitcoin was at uh, eighteen thousand, uh, nineteen thousand in December before it crashed. Um, it was so expensive that the Bitcoin uh, events, the conferences themselves, uh, cancelled that you had to pay in Bitcoin because it became so expensive. Uh, yeah, which is kind of completely counterproductive, right? You go to a uh, you go to a Bitcoin event, but you can no longer pay uh, in Bitcoin because uh, you would be uh, you know paying a fortune only in uh, in fees. Now, th so this is uh, this is absurd, but we need to point at those uh, absurdities. Okay. Um, yeah. Then, of course, there, there's the, this hotly debated issue whether uh, Bitcoin is, uh, you know, anonymous or not. Well, we know uh, that ultimately uh, it is not. Right? So we should also stop spreading uh, this uh, uh, this myth. Um, yeah, it is secure and cannot be hacked. <coughs> Unfortunately, also uh, not uh, the case. Uh, but the, the main problem uh, with Bitcoin, and, and this is where the, most of the debates are all about, uh, is this uh, core strategic issue uh, that Bitcoin can scale to world, world size, right? So that uh, all our transactions can be done. And uh, very uh, at the moment, this is uh, very, very definitely not the case. Uh, unless uh, very, very central uh, uh, elements in in the code itself, in the core architecture, are changed, uh, Bitcoin uh, cannot uh, be used uh, really uh, for massive uh, amounts of uh, payments. Well, but that's in part. This is a, this is a, a, a technical uh, discussion, of course. But uh, it is quite important in, in the sense that uh, 
how, how can we look at these currencies? Uh, are they alternative uh, uh, currencies, for instance, or are they additional currencies? And so this is already an important distinction uh, to make. Will uh, Bitcoin uh, or other cryptocurrencies eventually be an alternative for the euro, or should we look at it more in terms of a diversification? Uh, that's already um, an important um, distinction. Okay, in Money Lab, uh, we also discuss uh, stuff like this. Uh, uh, I, li I really like uh, Dr. Shrashkov's last book which really uh, looks at, uh, well, it starts with throwing rocks at, uh, at the Google bus and then, and then really starts to uh, argue from there. Okay, if you, that uh, throwing rocks at the Google bus, is of course the starting point of the critique of the free. Uh, but if you start to critique the free, where do you go from there? Uh, so this is the topic of uh, Douglas Rush. Uh, on the other side, um, on the East Coast, uh, also, uh, Trevor Schultz uh, and his uh, group at the New School in uh, New York uh, have for a number of years now have been uh, focusing on this uh, idea of uh, platform cooperativism. Uh, and it says that the, the, the platform co-op uh, should be further developed as the alternative uh, for centralized uh, platforms such as Uber, uh, Airbnb, uh, but uh, yeah, also maybe think of uh, uh, things like uh, Facebook uh, as well. Um, um, this is in particular focused on uh, the, the platforms that he is writing here about. Is particularly focused on uh, on Uber. Uh, in Amsterdam, we have, for instance, Airbnb. Uh, which is uh, looking at uh, you know how uh, people can run uh, their own software platform in a decentralized manner, so that the people who rent out their apartments uh, also uh, get uh, get the, the benefits from from that instead of it going through uh, to a centralized uh, server. Okay. Uh, one of the alternatives, uh, one of the more wilder projects that we like a lot are, um, uh, is this uh, kind of Deleuzean uh, band uh, coming out, out of uh, Helsinki. Uh, yeah, they're great Deleuzeans uh, with, uh, who really go nuts when it comes to you know, their almost utopian imagination about uh, how we can uh, redesign the uh, economy. The project is called Robin Hood Minor Asset Management. Um, and um, so this started off uh, as a um, Deleuzean hedge fund. And the idea was uh, you know, that, uh, that we would just come together, we would put some money together and, and start to act like a hedge fund, which I think is a great idea. And, um, Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out that way. But <laughs> here you can see the performance of the fund. <laughs> um, uh, we were rapidly losing money because we we made a completely wrong uh, decision. But yeah, that's that's all part uh, of uh, of the game. The theorists like uh, Tiziana Terranova, uh, she's involved in this. Uh, I'm also a big enthusiast uh, of of this. However. Uh, this project has then uh, turned into something else, into something maybe more serious. Uh, once the, the blockchain hype really started to take off, uh, people moved from uh, Helsinki to the west coast of America, and uh, the project uh, has transformed itself, and if you want to look it up on the website, it's called the Economic Space Agency. Uh, it's, it's still as mad as hell, um, but it has a tr uh, attracted a, a lot of uh, really great talent and very, very important cultural critics. So this is a really, this is a startup, this is a fintech startup run by uh, artists, philosophers uh, and uh, programmers, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, I'm really, really um, uh, interested. Uh, in, in, in what they do and, and the, the really fundamental discussions they have 
and in, in, the, in, the, in the way they uh, try to re redesign the fundamentals of our social relationship and our economic relationship in the digital age, right? So, um, yes, so if you, if you are interested, you know, have a look at them. Uh, this is really absolutely cutting edge and uh, I can highly recommend it. Another element maybe is uh, Zcash. I don't know, um, I, I don't want to do too much promotion for them, but uh, it, it is kind of interesting because Zcash uh, as a cryptocurrency uh, really uh, is cutting edge in the sense that it tries to combine Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, kind of uh, philosophies but then puts a whole uh, new layer of privacy and privacy uh, protection on top of it, right? So, um, so in that sense, uh, yeah, in, in, uh, in the relation to uh, crypto design, uh, uh, this is really uh, something uh, to uh, look at and, and to follow if you are uh, interested uh, uh, in, uh, in this. Okay, uh, yeah, this is kind of the dominating idea uh, that is, uh, floats around, uh, namely uh, uh, that we, uh, we are not as stupid as this Mr. Ronald Wayne, uh, uh, who, uh, who sold his uh, uh, Apple stake uh, uh, shares uh, uh, in a very early stage. And so this is kind of the, the driving forces of uh, of the, the speculative um, desire, the collective desire uh, to have history on our side. Uh, no matter how much money we're losing right now, it doesn't really matter because uh, we have this historical certainty on our side, right? Uh, and this is of course the, what, what is in, uh, called in the scene is called HODL, uh, uh, the HODL uh, ideology. Uh, HODL stands for, is a typo, uh, uh, if you type HOLD very fast, try to type it very fast, you will see uh, that uh, you, you will type uh, uh, you know, HODL uh, because you um, uh, reverse the L and the D. So HODL means uh, that uh, people, uh, so the hashtag HODL, if you're interested, look at uh, Twitter, it's really hilarious. It means that no matter how fast uh, the value of your cryptocurrency sinks, you need to uh, remain a believer and you should hold and you should not sell, right? Because this is, this is the whole premise of all the people who do the, the so-called uh, pump and dump uh, uh, sessions, right? There is an idea that uh, there is a there is a, there is a whole crowd like in this whole field, and they are all believers, and the believers should be told by the gurus that they should not sell the currency because what happens when they all when you here in this room all sell the currency, the pri the price is of course going down rapidly, okay? so you should be kept. Uh, uh, and in, uh, in some kind of uh, state of belief that maybe one day uh, uh, we will be as rich uh, as uh, this guy uh, here. And that one day uh, uh, the Bitcoin uh, will uh, blossom uh, on the graves of the pound, the, uh, the dollar, the yen and the euro, right? This is a mural in, uh, in Paris. Uh, and, uh, this is uh, kind of uh, what uh, uh, this is the essence of uh, uh, cryptocurrency as a belief system, uh, and this is kind of the the meme the meme reality. Uh, this is a famous uh, internet meme. Maybe you've recognized it. And uh, funny enough, uh, the Bitcoin at the moment is uh, at eight k, right? So uh, it has gone down a little bit, back to seven. We're now back at eight. So. Basically, uh, yeah, this is kind of uh, where we are. I love this picture too. Um, this is uh, this deals with uh, with an, quite an unknown uh, phenomenon, uh, the so-called pump and dump groups, uh, and the, these are insiders that bring in relatively uh, innocent outsiders, and they talk up a currency and uh, they pump it up, and then before. Uh, 
before the, the, the price goes down, the uh, initiators, uh, they sell, they leave the group, and then the, the naive uh, people uh, are there and they lose uh, a lot of their money uh, when uh, the currency is down. And this uh, illegal practice, by the way, this is an illegal practice, so you can go to jail uh, <coughs> for it. Uh, it's uh, definitely uh, you know, forbidden by law everywhere. Huh? So, uh, but this happens every time, every day. And so if you, you, you can even look uh, uh, online. Yeah, so this, uh, this is kind of the, the more of the, the, the digital full folklore, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a part that I love. I collect this digital folklore uh, around. Um, so store of value, they said. Lambos for hodlers, they said. Uh, so Lambo is of course a Lamborghini, and the Lamborghini is the is the symbol of the of the Bitcoin uh, millionaire, right? So all all the Bitcoin millionaires in the world they've bought uh, Lamborghinis, and this is not a myth. This is in fact uh, uh, happening. Eh? But the, on the long term, uh, of course, you know, uh, we're talking about ideologies and ups and downs and. Eh? Uh, but on the long term, I think this, uh, this is for instance, this is one of those startups that, uh, 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 but, but I like this because it kind of summarizes where we are. Uh, this transition is going, uh, going on as we speak, it's slow, uh, but it's also steady and a lot of people know that this, um, this mechanism uh, is almost uh, uh, inevitable and uh, will be very hard uh, to turn back once this dynamic is really uh, uh, happening. Uh, so the past was about platforms earning, the future is about people earning. I think this is really the essence of what we are trying to map in the Man Money Lab uh, uh, network. Here you, you see the two uh, publications. Uh, here you, you can see a few of the essays and the topics that we deal with here, for instance, Martin Zellinger, he is the organizer of the uh, Money Lab in London, uh, which happened in, uh, in uh, January. And for instance, in this essay, he compares uh, two, uh, two projects, uh, art projects. One is Bitcoin, uh, so, which is all about uh, kind of uh, art on the blockchain. And uh, Simon Denny's work uh, at the Berlin Biennale uh, 2016. It was a very, very large uh, installation in which he tried to uh, visualize the cryptocurrency ideology. And so this is a very, this is a work, an installation that a lot of uh, yeah, art critics uh, know about. Here uh, again, uh, for instance, in, uh, the last. Uh, uh, essay by Brett Scott, um, which is all about uh, digital payments and surveillance capitalism. Uh, so this is an element uh, in, the, in the discussion that we do not yet hear a lot about, uh, but should, that we should pay more attention to. If money uh, is digital and is stored uh, either on the blockchain or on the net or where, wherever, Right? Uh, we, uh, we will and we are uh, uh, subjected to very, very sophisticated forms of surveillance. Surveillance by states, by, uh, by secret services we have no idea about, read NSA, um, but also third parties who uh, are collecting uh, data uh, about you know, our financial well-being. Um, uh, and uh, of course we can you know, discuss uh, what is happening in China with the social credit system but uh, elements of that uh, is already uh, existing and in place uh, here in Europe and elsewhere in the world and uh, it is important to note uh, that uh, countries like Sweden but also in the Netherlands uh, that there is a dramatic drop in cash and so the, the so-called cashless society uh, is, is really well uh, underway. 
and uh, is that something that uh, you, you know we should uh, desire? So, so since uh, the last money lab, uh, we have uh, included uh, the discussion about cashless and uh, surveillance capitalism uh, in relation to digital money, because uh, there's very, very important um, uh, developments happening at that level. Another uh, issue is, of course, demonetization, um, just which uh, has happened uh, uh, in November 2016 on a very large scale in India, when Modi uh, um, made uh, about 80% uh, of the rupee uh, banknotes uh, illegal overnight. Uh, so that was a that was a very very big um, and drastic move, uh, which is, uh, uh, of course, related uh, to this whole idea uh, that the state uh, and uh, corporations and surveillance players will have a better grip uh, on the economy uh, if they can eliminate uh, cash. In India, it's, it's also uh, pretty clear uh, who will eventually pay that price, right? So the so and uh, it's very good to uh, you know gather material, speak with people there, and uh, discuss uh, this situation because uh, this can also happen and will happen uh, here uh, as well at some point. You know, maybe not as sudden uh, as uh, it happened uh, over there, uh, but. Uh, it is certainly something that we are very uh, concerned about and uh, you know, should be uh, collecting uh, experiences with and being in direct dialogue uh, with uh, people, for instance, uh, in India about this issue. Okay, uh, now I'm coming to a close and I'm saying, okay, the Money Lab is an ongoing uh, you know, project, you can join it. Uh, you can, uh, you know, contact us, become part of uh, uh, the list, or uh, contribute to the website, or whatever you want to do. Uh, this is the next uh, event, uh, late April, for the first time in uh, the United States, in upstate New York, in Buffalo. The famous art department uh, there, once led by Peter Weibel, <coughs> uh, Steve Kurtz. And maybe you've heard about um, the work they do there. Okay, so that's the next uh, Money Lab. There's also a Money Lab event happening uh, north of Frankfurt in this, the university town of uh, Siegen, uh, which is happening uh, uh, late uh, this this year, which will have, a, which will be maybe more academic and which will really also focus on making the link between, let's say, experimental money theory and German media theory, right? So uh, to make that link. And I've done that recently uh, in this conversation with Stefan Hadenreich from, uh, from Berlin, uh, which I, I, I published on, uh, on our website. Um, Stefan has now written three books about money theory. In the last one, uh, he really worked uh, maybe along the lines of the Economic Space Agency. Um, and he was uh, there playing with the uh, idea what happens uh, if we abolish money altogether. Uh, a lot of people, believe it or not, but a lot of people uh, in the more speculative realm are already taking this very serious. There's another element uh, in our work, which I already uh, uh, pointed at, uh, work that Brad Scott and, and Paul uh, uh, Sirio do, does, Femke Hergraven and others, and that is this element uh, let's say of how organized crime and the mafia relates to this new form of money. Because obviously, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, let's say, criminal energy out there, right? Uh, whether, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but at least uh, it, it is, a, it is a, a fact. And so, together with the city of Amsterdam, uh, we are organizing this big event. Uh, so if you want to look up the program, it's not really Money Lab, but uh, yeah, it's very close to what we do and we are involved, although it doesn't have uh, you know, the name. 
uh, here is the URL flyermoneyconference.eu uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, looking at uh, the way organized crime and the new money uh, are uh, interfering as we speak. Okay, I'll leave it there. If you want to contact us, uh, here are the details and uh, let's have uh, some discussion. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.